So is it supposed to come up with something about my video? Ah, there you go. You, we see you now. You see me? I, we see you. Okay, so I, I should start. Go for it. Yeah, well, thank you, Lisa and Paul, for setting this whole thing up. It's great. It's really um, wonderful in testing our abilities in a lot of different directions. So I'm going to start with a travel poem from California, which uh, I think has some bearing on what's going on in the country right now. It's called um, McGee Creek. We are still not out of the flowers at the end of the trail to the high valley where sluggish hypnotized bees pollinate in pots of nectar. Knee deep in lupins and fireweed, we could be Adam and Eve, so robed in beauty, all we could desire of wind, light, and rushing streams. Dark faces greet us. They're seated along the side making lunch, trail crew of convicts, all black, all young, the armed sheriff with skin like ours. One looks up, says, hello, I'm William. We nod. I want to, I want to reply. I want to say, I'm Janet. I'm so sorry. I'm afraid to speak. Hardly look him in the eye. The young man in the flowers and we thread between my husband and I. We cannot go back. It is time to leave. Not by right or possession do we walk free while our brothers are chained, yet children of the garden nonetheless. So is that really coming through? It feels weird. Yep, you're, you, we're hearing you and you're doing a great job. Okay, okay. So um, the remaining poems um, are going to um, come from a new manuscript, which is um, uh, delving into the dysfunction of childhood. And the personal really is political because what you learn as a child gets translated into how you face the world, um, into the way you work, the way businesses are run, the way public institutions are set up and function. Uh, so I'm gonna start with, this poem is called, Before I Remembered. I was never raped, at least I don't think I was. It might have been better if I had, because at least I would have something to tell. I would have adored a pound on or a face to cut up with scissors. But instead, I have only this body and the wall I am up against is the air that continues and continues down the long hill to a plain where a black speck burns up in the heat. It takes binoculars to see it grinning and wavering out there like a mirage. So I had a kind of problematic relationship with my father, which is understating things. Um, so here's this poem. It's called Crows. I'm gonna shut the window. Noisy. Crows. When my father died, something tore out of the room down the corridors, down the stairs, half feathered, half furred. I was flying away, my face turned away, carried by crows on blue-black wings, beating the deep, clear air. Who will I find to blame for the dying? Who can I rest to the ground to demand they unknit the cloth that has been knit? The body was sheer material, dark earth from which a daughter, a bird, a bud could grow. The bushy eyebrows and waxy skin, the stubble waiting for the plow. And two more. So I have my share of nightmares, which makes sleeping problematic. And the trouble with all of that is you go to sleep every night. Um, anyway, this is called What I Do About the Nightmares. Before going into battle, I bandage my head, light campfires, pull the covers down. No one can predict what happens on the plains of sleep, what glistening armies, where the black water, what its source. I wear my best head wrap boldly trumpeted in scarlet, sulfur, lime. It is important to scare off the enemy. 
Alternatively, I try kindness, console my head at the prospect of another night, cushion and cradle it so it will not cry so strenuously at being abandoned, or court it with aphrodisiacs and magnificat seeds. Let it gaze on the moon to fill up on lunacy. Just as another hell train revs up down the line, a praying mantis crawls outside the window with the bulging eyes of someone who has seen God. Why, why, oh little one, it wants to know. Have you locked yourself in for so long? And the last poem is called Lesson. They say there is always a door that love overcomes. Believe me, I have tried. I have practiced the violin like a good artist, strings stretched to breaking. You want something sweeter? All right, a sonatina, dulce. And finally, a pause. The sea pours into the empty cavity. What is unfolding does not have to be the murdered shark of my childhood. Let it remain nameless, follow its own breathing. Grapevines knit each limb of the puppet's body. Dreams enter and leave like delicate wings of powdery mayflies. See, I have made the scab lovely again. Blood for makeup, ink for my pen, this ancient oozing. How the body quietly sews itself up and hides the scar. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Janet. That was great. And thanks for keeping through your time. Is uh, Cindy there? Cindy Snow. I'm right here. Okay. Good to see you. You too. Good to see all of you. All right. Go. So I have, um, thanks. I have four poems. Uh, the first one's really short to sort of get warmed up. And before I start, I want to give a, a shout out to a former student, Marilyn Hartman, an excellent writer of short stories who right at this moment is um, losing her battle with brain cancer. So for Marilyn. So the first poem is a little tiny one without a title. The night's thin blue purple cape is rimmed crimson. Now orange fire, now honey yellow. Here's the sun, here's morning. And the second one, the title is Pi, like P-I-E, not P-I. <laughs> Near the elevator door, Joe, the janitor says, you're working late. I balance my books, bags, mug, say, it's that time of the year. He asks, how's it going? I decide, to be honest. It's hard, I say. My father's getting worse, but I'm thinking, don't go there. I have to get to the store before it closes. I need to buy apples. I have plans to make a pie with my father. It's something we do. I'll cut each plump Macintosh in half, lay it on the flat side so my father can slice. He'll tell me, I used to help my mother in the kitchen. A full sentence. He'll ask, how many pieces? How small? Where to put them? When to stop? I'll explain. He'll ask again and again. We'll keep it up for an hour. Out of the three I have to fill before bedtime. Joe says, my gram had dementia. He says that. Graham, not grandmother or someone in my family. And so she's there in the space between this young man's broom closet and the door I was heading toward. And I see him, a teenager then in his glasses, his baggy pants. He's holding her hand and she's nodding her head in that random way those with only scraps of memory do. This young man, his gram, his story tumbling out then, as I wonder how I'll fill the evening without apples. Uh, 
And the third one is um, thanks to radio. I tell you, my father wanted to name me Carmen after the opera, after that strong-willed woman who transfixed in the factory with her voice and boots stomping, skirt lifting. My father sat in that hospital waiting room where all good fathers sat, far from blood and screaming. What else could he do but think and listen to the radio? It wasn't his usual smoky jazz, not Motown, not blues. It was opera. And as soon as he heard it, he knew the name Carmen would suit his child to be, would give her a bit of rhythm from him and some attitude from her mother. So he listened in that far room at the end of the hall, listened for when the shouting stopped and the small squall of his first child began. With Carmen saved on his tongue, he waited for the nurse to call him, waited to pick that baby up and sing softly in her ear. And the last one is um, Dear Stanley for Stanley Kunitz. You said we need not a new place, but new eyes to see. In a new place, I touch polished stones, Spartan shelves, a hand-stitched quilt. I look out tree-lined windows, mountains skirted. There's a grand ginkgo biloba on the patio, its buds tight, multitude. A downy woodpecker prods, taps, and gouges that tree. Still, it frames the hilltops, waits for spring. I read about its split leaves, how it lived alongside the dinosaurs. The sun warms my face, blue inks the spaces between thready branches. How my eyes adjust and take in how my heart. Thank you. That was great, Cindy, thank you. Sorry we don't have, uh, you know, the clicking or the applause. Thanks for <laughs> Those being hands are very nice. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Jim, I mean, sorry, Ed, are you there? Ed's first. Is Ed here? I'm here. Excellent, there's your voice and there you are. Good to see you. You're on. All right, I'm gonna read a few um, poems from my book. And then I wanted to remind people the Slate Root Contest has started. So uh, $500 prize, send your manuscript. Uh, I'm gonna read a few poems from the book. And this one uh, is one of the things we need to learn from the current situation is patience. This is called The End. The end is postponed again, a shortage of plague, delivery problems with brimstone, pestilence is out sick, and calamity must get some sleep. All around the garden, rabbits can be heard sharpening their teeth, winding their springs. All we can do is wait. The next poem is called Then. And the important thing now is, hu is black humor, I think. Uh, then came January 26th, an error-free breakfast, a mailbox full of compliments and cash. And then overhead, heaven's robe opened, revealing celestial plumbing, which even a dentist would worship, and upstaging the rainbow scheduled for 3.19 p.m. And, and, and lightning set the snowman on fire, Rain flushed the skunk out from under the porch and rubbing her eyes, she had something to say, followed by our fumbling for new fuses. In short, it was the usual. And nature continues on despite everything. So this is called Worms Are Coming. Worms are coming to our dirt kingdom 
where muscles are long and mouths open. The first worm ever swallowed his tail and vomited forth God. The second worm was unimpressed, but hungry. So at the horizon, worms consider their celestial diets, a hankering for blue with hints of nova. At night, they put on their helmets and count the living. Everything on earth has been through a worm and will again. Moonlight is their dessert, rain, a topping to wallow in, dinner's gong, never quiet. And this is uh, dealing with uh, <laughs> being stalked by nature. It almost gets personal at times. Against all odds, the ex, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> against all odds, a crow has come for the carcass. The ex skunk does not care even as he hovers in a funk, for he has left everything, his stripe, appetite, and the job of picking up after the world. The crow tries again, this time upwind, walking like an undertaker who has discovered bingo late in life. But life goes on and it's work, work, work. The natural history of sweat, briefly. The dead sweat pearls, wrapping a lifetime of reasons around what will not work. Birds fly backwards, sweat over perspiring earthworms who squeeze out the sweat of kings. Every drop of water on the planet has been sweat or no sum. Even when work has gone home for the day, sweat remains, pacing itself for the next sweet one. And this is uh, not in the book, these are separate poems. And this one is, uh, speaks for itself, overtaken by events. Overtaken by events. It starts with a mosquito on damp wood brought in for the wood stove. The rain did not suffer its fall for this, being sucked into the heart's suitcase of wings, the six bare feet kept for meditation of a world too smoky for planned flight. Anyway, angels never really used their legs for walking the earth or treading air like survivors glad to be anywhere at all. They cannot help being here admiring the thousand ways blood is taken, but never returned. And I'm gonna end with a short one about one of our favorite predators, which it would be nice if that's, uh, if that's all we had to deal with. Mosquito, where are you, my love? Where's your slender thirst, your itch to sing on stilts to no applause? then slip away. Like lightning, you seek sudden perfection in illuminating the body's drum. Your stable of pale angels calls for you. God's skinny tusk, star root, worm, hurt, worm hook. You raise the world of welts we sleep on. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Have you ever you're seeing the applause are going wild, everyone's waving. You, you might not be able to hear it. Next up is Jim. Jim, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. I'm glad you made it. You're on. Okay. So this is pretty awesome. I'm here in Bernardston and really excited. And I'm gonna read maybe four or five poems. And the first one is um, one of my favorites uh, uh, from this book, um, published by Mr. Ed Rare. Um, it's called Young. I work with young people a lot. Um, I'm longtime track coach educator. So, and this is my attempt at an apology to young people for the mess that my generation has left for them. So this is called Young. 
Measure your steps by how many you love in the day. Once I had my whole life in front of me. I blinked, I'm sorry. Had good thoughts, intentions, believed in social justice, equality, but I sat on my ass and drank, got sober while sad America got sick around me. You are so bright and full of hope. Thank you. I have a meower here, climbing the screen. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, those birds are taunting her. Um, she's a 15 year old kitten named Crossbar, a pole vault cat, of course. Um, I, I threw this out um, on paper um, during the beginning of this shit, the, and it's called Pandemic Blues. In this season of the plague, I stay home, write poetry that doesn't satisfy me. I invented social isolation, so what the fuck's next? In this time of the worst president, I sleep too late and let the cat lay on top of me, take a hot bath. I drank to not feel. Now I feel to not drink. It sucks sometimes, but it's what I got. Thank you. In 1968, I was 20 years old. I was an athlete. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do <laughs> going forward, whether I was going to actually um, sign a baseball contract with a minor league. Um, but I had fallen in love with pole vaulting, and, and I was hanging around, um, not quite elite, um, but I was hanging out with the... Um, athletes from the Olympic Project for Human Rights. Um, there was thoughts of the black, black athletes boycotting, but it didn't happen. Um, so this is called The Stand. After Tommy and John, what else could I do? Lee Evans, The Stand. They wore beads on the metal stand to signify lynching systemic strangling of equality and justice back home. Tired of that shit. Two proud young men, 52 fucking years ago. Take a knee and take a real deep breath. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sure everybody remembers Tommy Smith and John Carlos, it's, sometimes it's hard. These are my heroes, so it's, sometimes it's hard to get through this. Um, the quote from Lee Evans, Lee Evans was gonna run the 400 meters after um, Tommy and John were kicked out of the um, Olympic Village. And he didn't know whether he was gonna do it or not, but he was convinced and he won. Been watching a lot of old sports on TV and I watched Several weeks ago, I watched Don Larson's perfect game in the 1956 World Series. I don't know if people remember that, but that's the only perfect game. And I was at that game and, and then watching it on TV, I remembered a lot of it. Um, I was there with my father. October 8th, 1956. You ride the train through Harlem, the tenements, hear the word slum for the first time. You're anxious because your father is a racist. You imagine Negroes attacking your rattling car. Bronx. You drink orange aid and eat pound cake from the train guy. The dirty subway makes your eyes flare. Your father has some kindness and a clean hanky. The game starts at one. Yankee Stadium is enormous and important. You forget about your eyes. Men wear soft hats. All those white shirts in center field. You see the Duke's marvelous catch, your hero, the Duke of Flatbush. Mantle runs one down in left center, saving a sure triple. Jackie's at third base. Jackie Robinson, older and slower. And you're eight and don't know how great the man is. The hated Mickey hits one out to right, bottom of the fourth, one nothing Yanks. Pinstripers add another run. 
Bauer, the ex-Marine, singles in carry, bottom of the six, two nothing Yanks. Larson, the newspaper's imperfect man, strikes out Mitchell to end it. No runs, no hits, no errors. Yogi jumps on him. You sleep most of the way back to the orchard. Um, that's what Indian Orchard, Massachusetts, that's what it's called. Um, I, just another quick one. Um, the title of the book, I'm speeding up, slow down, Jim. After a long season. When I was a boy, I imagined a young lion watching over me. Later, I drank that lion to feel safe. I broke and grew strong like mended wings. Fierce to imagine my one chance at living was getting old. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm doing. Um, thank you, everybody. This was awesome. Thanks, Jim. Really appreciate that. Uh, now, I'm just told that Janie, Janie doesn't have audio. So um, I'm going to move to Janice. Uh, and the rest of the Slate Roof folks, if you could uh, think about one uh, poem that you might do when we come back from Janice, if we have time. I'll try to get as many of you back in. We just heard from Slate Roof writers. Uh, please check out their website. Please check out uh, the stuff they have coming up. And now if we can hear from Janice. Janice, are you there? There you are, Janice. It's good to see you myself okay do you have your yes the audio going go for it okay hi there so um all of these were written since uh coronavirus began i look a little chunky to myself do i look chunky to you all no you look great let's hear them <laughs> okay um, this is called trying i was trying so trying Trying, trying to do things differently. Trying not to scrub the floor out of habit. Trying not to know where to put my anxious energy. Trying not to scroll past picture after picture of red-winged blackbird. Trying not to recognize something in their eyes. Trying not to apply for jobs I have no intention of accepting. Trying to re trying not to restack the wood, simply to create something with more structure. The drift. The sky pulls. The field pulls. My bed pulls. Inertia pulls. And I dangle like one of two magnets, searching for north or the pull of real things. All this fighting toward instinct against gravity, toward survival, against current, toward new life, against all I must not do, toward stagnancy, and against the desire to succumb. I succumb to the deep, sleepy rest and the forever drift of dreams and float into the swift and wet wonder until I open my eyes to find that my bed is dry rot and all that was once pliable has turned brittle and dis disintegrated into soft nothing. The thing in three parts. Number one, the thing that was following the thing was not the thing. It was the thing, the thing itself. The elevation gain and the job you used to have that brought you to this place was the thing. The mist from the cloud you saw disappear, followed by birds, was the thing. The arc of the rainbows that prompted you to exaltation from your couch 10 miles from Yosemite was also the thing. 
The fanfare that took you viral was the thing. You were true. Everybody loved you. You were true. Now the virus, the littlest thing that became the biggest thing has taken you. Rest in peace, bear, double rainbow guy. You are now the thing itself. Is it what it is? It is. Check. Is it as it is? It is. Check. Number two. The thing that was following the thing was not the thing itself, but it was the same thing. The heft of the water, the pull of the ocean floor, the force of the mountain on all the molecules, those two are the thing. There's time to wonder at the thing and time to act. There's a time to trace the outline of the clouds in the sky, to count the birds as they depart, and time to hit play. There are many kinds of comfort in every kind of zone. There's a beach at which to marvel. It's growing, glistening expanse, different in a way you've never known. It reaches quietly farther, farther, sucking the ocean back into itself with a mind-boggling sweep toward the opposite ocean shore in a preface to this tsunami. How will you spend your last minutes on Earth? Running or watching the magnificence? Is it what it is? It is. Check. Is it as it is? It is. Check. Number three. The thing that was following the thing was different and the thing itself. When the owl comes for you, eyes locked and blazing, you won't necessarily know that this is the thing, the new thing, the thing now. The claw's angled approach is unfamiliar, but trajectory, trajectory you know. Once the focused claws tip towards you, you will know. When gene genetic memory kicks in, you will remember again. You will know about velocity and train cars, about rodents and demise, fallen bread, breathless pleading, hard tack and dirty water. You will again remember the lying salesman and the useless seeds that will not sprout. You will remember the triple rainbow and the tsunami, the steel-toed boots and how easily snapped a man's or woman's ribs. You will remember what it is like to be wearing what you are wearing. Or you will remember what it is like to be the other you, standing by doing nothing. Is it what it is? It is. Check. Is it as it is? It is not. Rest in peace, George Floyd. Do I have time for another, Paul? Uh, how long is it? If it's a short one, yes. I have this one. And this one. <laughs> Which one's shorter? Whatever uh, one is shorter, go for it. I think this is shorter. All right. Things. Things are pushpins. Things are a pile of dead armadillos. Things are a list of words with my favorite at the top. Things are what you did not do while your souffle fell. Things are nothing if you declare it so. Things are the lot you've got on your mind. Things are the stuff your mom claims to know. I've seen things making their way to the top, slowly and with sour, like curds and whey. What's going wrong around here? 
and what's working are the things. One of the things is what I might say wrong. That is to say, if I do say something, oh, look, one just dashed across my window. I just spelled one of them wrong. I have hope that some of them will change. I can do without a bunch of things. Shall I list them? I gave a bunch away last week, but others are best kept for oneself, myself. I am a thing. Can I be thing nine? Would that be okay? Just don't delete me inadvertently. Watch that I don't end up in your trash. I still have a bunch of things to do. Great, thanks a lot, Janice. That was Janice Sorensen. We're gonna jump back to Slate Roof just uh, for a few moments. So Janet, do you have another one? Yes. Okay, go for it. I do. And just quickly, Slate Roof is running a nice contest that closes on July 31st. So if you have a chapbook manuscript of about 28 pages, go to our website uh, at Slate Roof Press at um, no, slateroofpress.com. Go there. And we make lovely books. See, they open up. There's a little moon. Opens up some more with a bigger moon. Opens up to a nice photo. This is all Ed Rayer's lovely work. Anyway, so I'm going to read a poem from my Slate Roof book. A little lighter than the last stuff I was reading. This is called your mission, your mission is to call the, oh, I'm, no, I won't give it away. You figure it out. Your mission is to call the beef to the edge of the table, to sing the butter to sleep, to unbalance my plate without my seeing it, to seduce me with your hot tongue, to mimic a sick child hiding all the while behind your cunning. The nose does not lie. It hears the meat sing. The meat crawls off my plate and kisses your tongue. You lap the air, tasting it. You belong to the meat. The meat told you to be here. It asked you to open your mouth. It never loved me. I'll never know how you married it secretly on the kitchen floor, how its flesh and yours became one how you swore love and fidelity forever and ever. How many ages its red hook had tugged at your brain, had cried in your dreams to be home. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jen. Cindy, do you have another one? Yes, I do. Great. But I have one um, that's by um, somebody else, and I think that's OK. But so I don't know if all of you know uh, Ross Gay. Here's his picture. Can you see it? He's like, uh, you know, 6'5", <laughs> gigantic wingspan, uh, African-American male. And I think that's somewhat important to this poem that he wrote. So that's why I share it. And it's from his book called um, A Book of Delights, The Book of Delights. So he catalogs things that delight him. So this one's called Tap Tap. I take it as no small gesture of solidarity and more to the point love, or even more to the point tenderness when the brother working as a flight attendant maybe about 50 the beginning of gray in his fade his american airlines vest snug on his sturdily built torso walking backward in front of the cart after putting my seltzer on my tray table said there you go man and tapped my arm twice tap tap Oh, let me never cease extolling the virtues and my adoration of the unwarranted, the warranted familiarity. You see family in that word, don't you? Family, expressed by a look or tone of voice or today on this airplane between Indianapolis and Charlotte, a tap, two tap tap on the triceps by which it's really a kind of miracle was expressed a social and bodily intimacy on this airplane at this moment in history our particular bodies making the social contract of mostly not touching each other irrelevant or rather 
writing a brief addendum that acknowledges the official American policy, which is a kind of de facto and terrible touching of some of us, or trying to, always figuring out ways to keep touching us. And this flight attendant, tap, tap, reminding me like that, simply remember, tap, tap, how else we might be touched. And we are, there you go, man. Uh, thanks so much. That's Ross Gay. Yeah, thank you. Ed, do you have a, another one that you can do? I think I got time for one more. You gotta unmute yourself there. Okay. All right, I've got one for baseball and uh, vampires. Spring's favorite predator, the gnat, watches Nosferatu and levering the wind's loose cape aside, lands on a sweaty neck. It is not better than an arm or even some delicate sun avoidant part, just some skin hold, hold hoarding a rusty river. This picnics a job like any other, except perhaps baseball, where waiting in an open crypt, the at-bat team watches helplessly as a pop-up bruised and limp at its apogee, hangs everything on sprouting wings and drawing hot blood from a punctured sky. Ah, thanks, Ed. Uh, Jim, do you have a real short one? I think we can get one more in if it's short. Uh, you're still muted. You got me? Yep, you got a short one? Most of mine are short. Okay, go for it. This is called Wreckage of the Future. I am often running far ahead, catastrophizing in my alcoholic brain, imagining the worst. I am a rapper of the what ifs. And it leaves me falling out of love with nows. Snow on my fields listens like a beautiful white sorrow. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. So uh, thanks to everybody. You've listened to Slate uh, Roof Writers, and you also had the guest of Jan Sorensen here today. We have a lot of six or seven other great writers next Saturday and the Saturday after that. Uh, I'll be one of the featured writers. Please check out all the writers that you 